Hi, I'm Amy, and this is the Android Authority Channel. Android and iOS are two greatly different worlds, each one having a thick population of users. The experience in each environment is such that migrating from one to another often causes culture shock. But then again, once settled in, the newcomer realizes that even though Android and iOS seem to be completely worlds apart, they actually do have certain similarities. In this episode, let's talk about the latest version of Android, Android 4.2.1 Jelly Bean, and Apple's latest software, iOS 6.1. How are they alike? How do they differ? Watch this review and find out. First, let's talk about one of the most important aspects of any mobile operating system, the user interface. Right after booting up your phone or tablet, you'll see its lock screen. What does Jelly Bean's lock screen allow you to do besides unlocking the device? A lot, actually. For one, it shows you a digital clock with the day and date. This one's the icon for unlocking the phone. Just drag it to the outer ring to unlock. You can also launch Android's default search app, Google Now, like this. Or launch the camera by pulling the right edge to the middle. Or even view lock screen widgets for Gmail, text messages, calendar events, and more. You can also access your notifications right on the lock screen. Just pull down the notification shade to see what new notices are waiting for you. Or change some device settings quickly by pulling down the quick settings menu. In Jelly Bean on tablets, you'll also see user icons, part of the new multi-user feature, which lets you set up more than one user profile on a tablet. What about on iOS 6? Not nearly as fancy as Android, but the lock screen here pretty much does a lot of what Android can. For instance, the time, day, and date are also displayed here, although without the year. This slider, as you guessed, is for unlocking the phone. Slide it this way to launch the camera. It's a little bit different on the iPad 4. There's no shortcut to the camera, but there's one for the photo frame feature. Apple's virtual voice assistant Siri can also be summoned from the lock screen. Just tap and hold the home button. Hi there, Maria. The notification center, however, is not accessible from the lock screen, unlike in Android. Instead, the notifications themselves are shown on the lock screen, and you can act on them right from the lock screen. In both Jelly Bean and iOS 6, the home screen is the starting point of all that you want to accomplish on your phone or tablet. It basically functions like the desktop on a computer. In Jelly Bean, the main home screen looks like this. You get a status bar, which usually just shows the time, network signal strength, and battery level. Here's a clock widget, which you can remove if you want. Down here is the favorites tray for holding your most used app shortcuts. And below the favorites tray is the navigation bar. In iOS, you get pretty much the same elements and functionality, although they look a bit different. This is the status bar here. You don't get a clock widget in iOS because it doesn't allow widgets on the home screen, but you do get all of your apps on the home screen. This down here is the app dock or favorites tray, and below it is the navigation bar with only the home button. In Jelly Bean, you have five home screens to use, and that's a fixed number. You can remove home screens or add more. You can place stuff here, such as widgets, which are useful mini windows to your apps. This is something that iOS doesn't support. You can change the home screen's background. You can even change it to a moving background known as Live Wallpaper, which is another feature not available in iOS. You can place app shortcuts like these ones here. You can even organize the shortcuts into folders like this one. If you don't like the arrangement, move things around or remove them, except the Google search bar, which always wants to stay on this spot on all home screens. iOS, on the other hand, creates home screens as needed. When one home screen is filled up, a new one is created to accommodate the new shortcuts. Like in Android, you can also group these icons into folders or rearrange the icons according to your preference. The search function is on its own page to the left of the main home screen. The favorites tray in Jelly Bean and the app dock in iOS 6 are nothing more but containers or holders for your favorite app shortcuts. Unlike shortcuts on the home screen, these favorite shortcuts don't move with the home screen. They stay in place on this bar on all home screens within quick and easy reach. On phones, you can place up to four shortcuts or folder on the favorites bar, and more on tablets. In Jelly Bean, however, the app drawer shortcut is not removable. iOS doesn't have an app drawer. For navigation, Android 4.2 relies heavily on dynamic virtual buttons such as these ones for back, home, and recent apps. You'll see these buttons on nearly every page and screen, but at times they hide or completely disappear from view to give more viewing space. 
iOS 6 uses a different navigation logic. Instead of using virtual navigation, it relies mostly on just one physical button, the home button, which is a jack of many trades, including waking the device, returning to the main home screen, opening the search page on the home screen, launching Siri, showing music playback control bar on lock screen, and opening the app switcher. To switch between tasks, tap the Recent Apps button in Jelly Bean, or double tap the Home button in iOS to open the app switcher. In Android, you'll see a scrollable wall of thumbnails of apps that you recently opened. Easily remove apps from the wall just by flicking to either left or right. In the app switcher in iOS, you'll see only the app icons. To remove them, first long tap on an icon until it wiggles, then tap on the Remove badge on each icon. It's a simple app switcher, but there's more. Scroll to the left of the app switcher to access buttons for locking screen orientation, playback control, and the music app. Scroll further to the left to find the volume slider. Notifications in both Jelly Bean and iOS alert you to items that need action or your attention. The two operating systems, however, differ in the way notifications are displayed or handled. In Jelly Bean, you get notifications through the notification shade or the notifications menu. Just pull down the status bar to open it. You can expand or collapse long notifications. Dismiss notifications one at a time by flicking it to the left or right, or dismiss all in one go with the help of this button. Certain types of notifications are also actionable. Notification of a missed call, for example, will display callback and message buttons so you can respond right away from the notification shade. Jelly Bean's notification shade also lets you reach for your most frequently accessed settings and toggles through this new button, which opens the Quick Settings menu. This menu can also be accessed by pulling down the status bar with two fingers, or on tablets by pulling downwards from the right half of the status bar. In iOS 6, the Notification Center can be opened just like an Android. But unlike an Android, you can't flick a notification to dismiss it. You can remove notification groups only one at a time. It can get tedious if you get a lot of notifications. But this also ensures that you do see all notifications. After all, in iOS, just like an Android, you can set which apps to allow to push notifications to the Notification Center. iOS, however, lets you choose how to display notifications. While the home screen in iOS does not allow widgets, its notification center does, although just a select few. On the iPhone 5, for instance, the weather and the stock exchange widgets are present in the notification center by default, but you can deactivate them if you want. If you log into your Facebook and Twitter accounts, widgets for them will also appear in the notification center, and you can post updates and tweets right from the notification center. Both Android 4.2 and iOS 6 provide simple stock keyboards with multi-language support, voice-to-text input, word prediction, spelling suggestions, auto-correction, and more. I like the Jelly Bean keyboard for four reasons. First, the keyboard keys display in uppercase or lowercase when using the Shift key. In the iOS keyboard, the keys are always in uppercase. Second, it has voice-to-text functionality just like the iOS keyboard, but Jelly Bean lets me use it even without an internet connection. Voice-to-text in iOS always wants an internet connection. Third, next word selection guesses and suggests what word I might type next. It saves me time. iOS doesn't have this feature. And fourth, if I don't feel like tap typing, I can slide type through Jelly Bean's gesture typing feature. This works like swipe and is not available in iOS. As for the iOS keyboard, I like it for two reasons. First, it has a bigger collection of emoji icons, which puts the Android keyboard's text emoticons to shame. And second, the iOS keyboard for tablets can be split to make thumb typing easier. The stock Android keyboard doesn't have this ability. Jelly Bean and iOS have features that make them usable and accessible to as many people as possible, including those with disabilities. Android 4.2's accessibility features include voice feedback, navigation by swiping, display magnification, larger text, auto-rotating screen, speaking out passwords, text-to-speech, accessibility shortcut, and web accessibility scripts. I like iOS 6's accessibility features better. They are grouped according to disabilities such as vision, hearing, learning, and physical and motor disabilities. The options include such features as voice feedback, zooming in large text, inverting colors, text-to-speech output, hearing aid mode, camera flash alerts, mono audio, guided access, assistive touch, and adjusting click speed for the home button. On a regular desktop computer, screen savers activate to prevent screen burn and to lessen power consumption. Android 4.2 has a similar feature called Daydream. It automatically kicks in when your device is charging or docked. You can choose to show a photo frame, a photo table, trends from Google Currents, a dynamic colored wallpaper, or a clock as screen saver.
Let's now take a look at the communication features in Android 4.2 and iOS 6. For managing contacts, you have the People app in Android 4.2 and the Contacts app in iOS 6. Both apps perform exactly the same role to organize your contacts. You can store contact information locally, import contacts from the storage or SIM, or sync existing contacts from your Google account in the case of Jelly Bean or from iCloud in the case of iOS. The contacts list in iOS looks like a virtual phone book, nothing more, just a list of names. Even a contacts info page looks very plain and simple. Small thumbnail photo here, contact name, and contact number and email. To call, tap the phone number. To send email, tap on the address. There are also quick buttons down here for composing a text message, sharing the contact card, calling through FaceTime, or adding the contact to favorites. I find Android 4.2's People app more colorful and more interesting. You get three different ways to view your contacts. Through the Groups tab, through the Contacts list, and through your favorites. All your contacts are sorted alphabetically on a list with a mini profile picture beside each name. Each contacts page shows a bigger profile photo, contact info, and recent status updates from Google+. Calling contacts can be done with just a tap on a contacts number. In iOS, the phone app has tabs for favorites, recents, contacts, keypad, and voicemail. Tap the label to switch to the tab. In Android, you get only three, dialer, call logs, and people. Switching between tabs is easy, just swipe left or right. The iOS phone dialer is simple. It's just a tile of number keys with the call, backspace, and add new contact buttons at the bottom. The Android dialer is the same, but I think it looks better. Android's call logs tab and iOS's recent tab show your call history. iOS lets you view all calls or only missed calls. Missed calls are shown in red, so you can easily spot them. Android lets you see more of your call history. You can view all calls or filter the list to show missed calls only, outgoing calls only, or incoming calls only iOS splits favorites and contacts into two separate tabs. Your starred contacts are on the favorites tab and the rest are on the contacts tab. Android merges these two tabs into just one. The people tab where your starred contacts are displayed in a magazine style layout at the top of the list, followed by your most frequently called contacts. And finally, the rest of your contacts will have phone numbers. For incoming calls, both platforms display the contact information and profile picture on the screen iOS makes it extremely easy to take a call. Just swipe the slider like this. To decline a call, you'll need to take an extra step. Drag this tab upwards to show additional buttons to reject the call, reply with a message, or to decline the call and remind you about it in one hour. The extra step is a feature for preventing accidentally rejecting calls. In the case of Android, every action that you might possibly need to do for an incoming call is right there on the incoming call screen. Answer the call, reject the call, or decline the call and send a canned message. To avoid accidentally answering or rejecting, you'll need to drag this button to the outer ring. Text-based communication in Jelly Bean is handled by the messaging, Gmail, and stock email apps. In iOS, it's the messages and mail apps. The app for SMS and MMS messages in both operating systems have similar functions. Conversations are displayed as text bubbles in a conversation thread. I find Android's conversation threads more pleasant because thumbnail photos of the sender and receiver are displayed along with the messages. iOS has a plain and simple conversation thread. The text bubbles in iOS are color-coded. Gray for messages received, green for messages sent via your phone carrier, and blue for messages sent via iMessage. Long tapping on a message in iOS lets you copy the message. In Android, you can copy, forward, lock, delete, or view details of the message. iOS also allows you to select multiple messages in a thread to either forward or delete. In Android, you have to either delete individually or all messages at once. You can access messages from the lock screen and home screen on either iOS or Jelly Bean. In iOS, a message notification alert appears on the lock screen and in the notification center. Android allows more access by letting you use the messages widgets on both lock screen and home screen. Jelly Bean uses Gmail as the default email client. But for those who don't have or don't want Gmail, there's the stock email app for Android. It supports the POP3, IMAP, and Exchange protocols. In iOS, you only have the Mail app. There's an official Gmail app for iOS, but it is not installed by default. You can set up an iCloud, Exchange, Gmail, Yahoo, AOL, or Hotmail account in the Mail app. You can also manually set up a POP3 or IMAP account. Both Android and iOS are app-driven platforms. Everything you do on your device, you do through an app. In Android, the Google Play Store is the main and preferred source of apps, but definitely not the only one. In iOS, it's the Apple App Store. 
These repositories practically have the same functions, although they look and are laid out differently. To install an app from these official sources, just tap on the Install button on the Apps page. When you install apps in iOS, the system will prompt you for your password. This is a security feature. Android 4.2, however, doesn't prompt you for your password every time you install an app, but you can restrict app purchases by setting a PIN. Also, in Android, you will see a list of permissions that you need to grant to the app before it will be installed. This list of permissions lets you decide whether or not to proceed with installation because it tells you what parts of the device the app will have access to. Android also allows installation of apps from third-party sources. As a security measure, this is not enabled by default but is available if you need it. To uninstall an app in iOS, just tap and hold an app icon on the home screen until the icons start wiggling, then tap the Uninstall badge. Or, you can go to Settings, General, Usage, tap the app's name, and tap the Delete button. In Android 4.2, you can uninstall apps from the app drawer itself. Long tap on an app in the drawer, then drag and drop the icon to the Uninstall button. You can also uninstall apps from the Apps page in the Settings menu. For browsing the web, Android 4.2 has Chrome and iOS has Safari. Both of these browsers provide simple controls for web browsing. Both are capable of tab browsing and private browsing. They also let you add bookmarks, sync browser data to or from a cloud account, and more. In Chrome, I particularly like that it can open unlimited tabs, browse in incognito mode, or view a page's mobile view or desktop view. Safari, on the other hand, can display a page in a reader-friendly way, save a page for offline reading, and, on supported devices, show sites in full-screen landscape view. For search, Jelly Bean uses the Google Now app, which, in Google's own words, gets you just the right information at just the right time. It can show you info such as news, weather, traffic, events and appointments, bookings, package deliveries, and more. Of course, it can also search your device's contents such as apps, contacts, music, and bookmarks, as well as search the web using Google's search services. The Google Now app also integrates Google Voice Search functionality, which means you can just tell the app what you're looking for. It can even act as a voice-activated assistant so you can instruct it to launch apps for you, compose and send messages, compose and send emails, create calendar events, look for maps, find directions, and more. Google Now is accessible in at least three ways. From the lock screen, by tapping the Google search bar on any home screen, or by swiping the home button upwards. In iOS, searching is done through the search home screen, which you can swipe from the left of the main home screen. You can also invoke the search page by tapping the home button once on the main home screen. The app can search through your device's contents, such as your messages, emails, and contacts, as well as through the web or on Wikipedia. Or you can dictate your search terms to Siri, the voice-activated assistant on iOS, and Siri will do the lookup for you. Siri, of course, does more than just help you with search. You can also run commands using your voice. What I find endearing about Siri is that it interacts with me, even responds to me. Both iOS and Jelly Bean's stock camera apps are simple, easy to use, very fast, and responsive. I rarely notice shutter lag in either the iOS or Jelly Bean camera. Both provide all the basic features that a casual shutter bug like me needs, including autofocus and face detection. You can use pinching gestures on the viewfinder to zoom in or out of your subject too. Both are likewise capable of HDR mode and panoramic shooting. From the viewfinder, you can quickly view your previously captured photos just by swiping. Between the two camera apps, however, the Jelly Bean camera app brings more goodies. Android 4.2 on the Nexus 4, for example, has the Photosphere feature, which lets you photograph your surrounding in 360 degrees. You can choose white balance modes, exposure levels, and scene modes. The video recorder in iOS is also a very simple app. The Jelly Bean camcorder, in contrast, provides extra frills such as time-lapse recording, video quality setting, geotagging, and white balance presets. Despite its being a very simple and minimalist camera, I like the iOS camera app chiefly because of its simplicity. I also like the shutter effect when capturing photos. Most of all, I find it awesome that I can use the volume buttons as shutter buttons. In iOS, your pictures and images are stored in the Photos app. It's the equivalent of the Gallery app in Jelly Bean. Captured photos and recorded videos are stored here, usually organized into albums or folders. In each album, the images are shown as thumbnails. You can also view individual images and can pan or magnify them iOS displays album photos as thumbnails arranged on a grid. However, in Jelly Bean, you can switch between grid view and film strip view. In film strip view, you can easily delete photos just by flicking up or down. Android also lets you group your photos not just according to album but also according to locations, times, people, and tags. 
Neither iOS nor Jelly Bean lets you move images from one album to another, but iOS lets you copy images from an album to another. Jelly Bean won't let you add new empty albums either, but iOS does. Both platforms provide basic photo editing functions. iOS only has four, image rotation, auto enhancement, red eye removal, and cropping. Android lets you do more, such as apply filters and effects, use custom frames, transform images, and adjust image and color values. The two operating systems are capable of running photo slideshows, but I find iOS more flexible in this regard. In Jelly Bean, you can't tweak slideshow settings, but in iOS, you can. For example, you can choose transition effects and play background music for your slideshow. You can even run a slideshow on the lock screen of iOS tablets. Videos captured by the camera app are stored in the Photos app in iOS and in the Gallery app in Android. When playing a video file, you'll see scene thumbnails on the progress bar. You can also share or delete videos from from here. As you can see, the interface is very simple. You can trim your personal videos too. Copied or downloaded videos are stored in the Videos app in iOS. Android doesn't have a separate app for videos like iOS does. Instead, downloaded videos are stored in the Gallery app. Video playback controls in iOS are simple, but unlike its counterpart in Android, this video player has previews and next buttons, plus quick access to the volume slider. But you can't share videos from this app. Jelly Bean also has a new feature for sharing your device's display wirelessly to another supported display, such as a compatible HDTV. It's similar in functionality to AirPlay in iOS 6, though the feature is currently available only on the Nexus 4 iOS stores all your music files in the music app, grouped by playlist, artist, album, and etc. Songs purchased from iTunes are also synced in the app. You can use equalizer presets, but you'll need to go to the settings menu to be able to pick a preset. You can't adjust equalizer levels manually either. On the iPhone 5, you can use the shake to shuffle feature. There's also a volume level normalizer function called soundcheck. Even when navigating away from the music app, music continues to play, but you won't find playback controls anywhere, not even in the notification center. Album art for the currently playing music will be shown on the lock screen, and the track's title below the time. Double tap the home button to bring up the playback control buttons. The lock screen controls for the music app in iOS 6 are tweaked a bit. The previous and next buttons are much farther away from the play and pause button. This way, you'll be ensured that you won't accidentally press the play or pause button when trying to select the next or previous track. The equivalent app in Jelly Bean is the Play Music app. Songs are also grouped according to playlist, artist, album, songs, genres, or recently added. Songs bought from the Google Play Store also sync to your local device. This bar here shows your currently playing song. You can use equalizer presets if you want. You can even manually set your own equalizer levels, unlike in iOS. When navigating away from the Play Music app screen, music continues to play in the background, and playback controls appear on the notification shade and on the lock screen. But perhaps the greatest thing that I like the most about playing music in Jelly Bean is that I don't need special software to copy my music files from PC to phone or tablet. I only need a USB cable. Both Jelly Bean and iOS, of course, have security measures in place. After all, mobile security and safety are important. In Jelly Bean, most of the security features from Android 4.0 Ice Cream Sandwich have been carried over, including different lock screen types, device encryption, displaying owner information on lock screen, SIM card lock on phones, and preventing installing apps not from the Google Play Store. Android 4.2 adds some new features such as a built-in app verifier that warns you if an app contains malicious content and an improved Android permissions list, which I find easier to understand than the bulleted list in previous versions. You can also tap a permission like this to expand the description. Meanwhile, in iOS 6, you get security features such as a four-digit or alphanumeric passcode on the lock screen, restricted access to apps and media contents on the device, automatic data wipe after entering wrong passcode more than 10 times, email confirmation if an Apple account has been used on another device, remotely locating, locking, and wiping data on Apple device with the Find My iPhone app, restricted installation of apps not from the App Store, privacy settings for showing which apps have access to your personal data, and stronger protection against hacking and jailbreaking. In sum, Android 4.2.1 Jelly Bean and iOS 6.1 represent the best of what the world's latest and hottest mobile operating systems have to offer. They do not offer uniform experiences, not even alternative experiences. Both platforms differ, but they serve a common goal, that of satisfying your mobile needs. In iOS, you get a well-defined and well-guarded environment that will have you using your mobile device easily and seamlessly. 
In Android, you get a feature-rich environment that lets you enjoy the freedom to make your device truly your own and to make it do your bidding. The question really is not about which operating system is the absolute and universal best. It's about which operating system can serve your needs best. It's all about you. So, which OS has the features that fits your needs? Android 4.2 Jelly Bean or iOS 6.1? Let us know in the comments. For more Android news and reviews, go to AndroidAuthority.com. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. I'm Amy. May the light side of the Android Force be with you.